Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very, very much for attending the inaugural Music First Young Composers competition. My name is Jim Frankel, and I am the founder and director of Music First. It is my absolute pleasure uh, to uh, be joined today by Judith Weir. Um, a, a thrill of a, of a career, to be honest, um, to have a composer of such esteem uh, with us. So first off, I'd like to thank Judith for um, agreeing to uh, listen to all the student work uh, and then come today for this masterclass. I would also like to thank uh, with all my heart, uh, Richard, Matt, Rachel, and Natalia for doing all of the behind the scenes work uh, to get this up and running. And most importantly, a huge thank you to all of the students who submitted their works, who composed and and put their work out there for judging, as well as their fantastic teachers. So we thank all of you teachers and students and parents, if you're watching as well, uh, for being a part of this inaugural event. We're very excited. Before I turn things over to Richard Payne, who will be the MC for today's masterclass, I'd just like to read a little bit about Judith uh, so that you get some context uh, about her career, if you don't already know about it. Judith Weir was born into a Scottish family, uh, but grew up in the outer London boroughs of Brent and Harrow. She learned to play the oboe while at school and performed in the National Youth uh, Orchestra, I guess, of Great Britain. She also started to arrange and create music during her teens and received advice and encouragement from the great composer, John Taverner, who lived nearby. Judith later studied music at Cambridge University Following her studies there, she first worked as a community composer with Southern Arts Association, mainly in the schools and with amateur musicians in rural Southern England. Following this, she taught music in Glasgow, Scotland for several years. Judith's work spans many genres from folk music to opera. She has worked as resident composer to the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra and BBC Singers and currently, and perhaps most importantly, holds the 400-year-old royal appointment of Master of the Queen's Music, the very first woman to do so. So before turning things over to Judith, I'll turn things to my colleague, Richard Payne. Thank you very much, Jim. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Payne. I'm the Education Manager for Music First. And again, I'm delighted to um, welcome Judith um, to this afternoon's uh, Composers Competition Masterclass. So as you'll probably all be aware, there are three categories. So there's 11 to 14 year olds, uh, 15 to 16 year olds and 17 to 18 year olds. There are two finalists in each category. And the way things are going to work is we're going to go through each of the pieces. I will play a short excerpt from each one. And after each one, uh, Judith will do a short commentary on uh, the piece, on each of the pieces, and then we'll have a, a bit of a QA and a at the end. Now, um, as students or indeed teachers, if you're the ones who are controlling uh, uh, your end, uh, you can write any questions in the Q&A and we will address them as we're going along or at the end. Um, there won't be any sort of verbal um, questions happening, but uh, if you put any questions you have into that Q&A, then we'll be able to um, handle them either as we go along or at the end. And at the end of the session, Judith will announce the uh, winners of each category. So three winners, one from each. And uh, those people will get a, an engraved copy of their score um, bound, printed and signed by Judith um, in due course uh, when we've had a chance to do it. So um, yes, so I will uh, first of all announce the uh, finalists. So here they are. So 11 to, 11 to 14, we have Boromir Ivanov from Tiffin School, Jennifer Rees from Mumbles Music Tuition. The 15 16 category, we have Tabena on Yezu from St. Ignatius School in Enfield, and Charles Henderson from St. Ignatius School in the Cayman Islands. In the 17 to 18 year old category, we have Adam Howell from Sutton Grammar School and Laser Corrigan from Wellington College, Belfast. I hope I've pronounced all of those correctly. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna to go 
to uh, Boromir's um, score. So if you just bear with me while I share my screen. So I think this is the right one. Just double check. Yes, okay. So uh, I'm gonna play this one through and uh, well, an excerpt of it, and then I'll pass it over to um, Judith. So uh, here we go. So there we go. There is um, the um, excerpt from the prelude. So I'm now going to hand over to Judith to talk a little bit about it. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Boromir, for this very rousing start. Um, I was delighted to see, I, I absolutely thought the first thing I must do is try and play this piece. And um, although it's a very grand, big piece, I think that it's extremely well written for the piano. So I want to give you my first bit of thanks, which is that you've written a piece, which in a way is easier to play than it sounds. And that's uh, really what we need to have rather than the opposite way round. But I think it's very well conceived for the instrument. And if you all look at this extract, we're looking at the moment, page one, um, really there are three things happening. There's a tune at the top, uh, not much of a tune to start with, but wait, it'll grow. And at the bottom, we've got these very foundational chords, which keeps the whole thing uh, really anchored. And in the middle, some harmony. And in fact, it's cleverly written because if you just uh, get those outer uh, notes out of the way, then your hands can reach to the chords as well. So I think this has been written by someone who probably plays the piano, but certainly understands how it works. And uh, the next thing that I admire, and I'm sure all the listeners did too, is this lovely chromatic harmony, which starts right at the beginning. If you look at those first four bars and those inner chords, uh, the way that the uh, chords slip down, semitone by semitone, but it all sounds absolutely gorgeous, very luscious. So to do that and not get in a terrible mess, you really have to understand where those chords relate to each other. And uh, the composer here has certainly done that. Now, the other thing that I really like about the piece is that it has great contrasts of texture. And by what I mean texture is the different thicknesses and thinnesses of the sound on the piano. Uh, we've all just looked at uh, page one. I wonder, Richard, could you take us to now to page, hmm, could you take us to page four, please? which I don't think we got to. Thank you. Now, have a look at that. The top system there, the top two staves, that's a big meaty 
bit of music still, huge chords, huge stretches. But look what happens in the second system, the second lot of staves. It becomes simply a two-part composition. You could call it a two-part invention if you know uh, those Bach pieces. And so the composition here switches from something incredibly thick, strong, busting out with notes to this much more delicate texture. And that I think makes it a very interesting piece. And um, it, this continues really towards the end with this very busy left hand, but it becomes a much more delicate piece suddenly. And I think as we would all say, that kind of contrast is very helpful in music, uh, not just to stay stuck in one place, but to move uh, into something quite different. Uh, I wonder if we can now see page two, Richard. Sorry, hope everyone doesn't get dizzy while we keep doing this. Do you remember that the tune at the top of this composition started off for several, quite a few bars with just two notes. Dum, ba, bum, da, ta, ta. And can you see now that at the top of each of these bars, that very simple, you could hardly call it a tune, is turning into a tune, turning into a rather beautiful tune. So here again, I think the development of the melody has been very, very skillful. Now, I always try when I'm thinking about compositions, which are my favorite bits. And I think probably th this final piece that we looked just beforehand with this thinner texture. Um, if I have one piece of, of advice, it would be probably the next time that you write a piano piece. Yes, try and, and write with not so many chords and with, with more counterpoint between the two hands. Um, I'm saying that because I think delightful though I found this composition, it's very difficult once you start using these big meaty chords, they very soon begin to remind us of the great composers of the past. There's nothing wrong with that, but really I want to know what your new invention in composition is. And I think with these final bars, that, that is what you've done. You've done something really interesting. Um, one thing I think I should just also talk to you about is the um, tonal uh, composition. In other words, what keys are you in? And I will say that you stay pretty tightly in E flat minor. That's fair enough. You told us it was called prelude in E flat minor, and uh, that's where you are. But I think just occasionally to just pop out of that key, once again, as a matter of contrast, could have been interesting. Um, even if you just do it enharmonically, in other words, in uh, an adjacent key that isn't so close. Um, could you just finally, my final request, Richard, is to see page three of Boris. Okay, get that. Yeah, here we are. So if you will remember, the composition starts the first two pages with the big chords, and really we're very firmly in E flat. And then this top little bar here, which is just repeated twice, uh, which is a nice surprise. It breaks into these uh, arpeggio patterns. That's a place where I might maybe have gone into a sideways key. You're in E flat minor. I guess a, a, a place you could go just for a moment would be B major, because that's uh, pretty much the same chord as you've written, but uh, just with one alteration. And you could write it out as C flat, E flat, G flat, if you like. So just little turns like that, I think, might uh, touch up this piece up even more. But I think, on the whole, uh, it's been a pleasure to see, and for me, even to try and play uh, a composition which is so well written for the piano. So thank you very much, uh, Boromir. Great. Thank you, Judith. So we'll now move on to the next one, which is um, Gen Tet. So I'll just... Um, move over to that one and I'll uh, press play in a moment.
thank you very much. Uh, and that was Jane Tett. And uh, I'm taking that uh, Jennifer called this piece after herself, which I think is a very good idea. I'd never thought of it. I might try that with some future Judith concerto or something like that. But I think there's another reason uh, it's called Jane Tett. Uh, and it's this. I wonder if how many of you, when you saw this first page of the score, as I did, thought I could see four staves, it must be a quartet. There are four people playing. But then in small letters under violin one, I can see two violins. And in fact, I was rather glad to hear that two people would be playing this upper stave, because if you go to page uh, bar five, which is where the violins enter, I think anybody who is a, a violinist watching this uh, live stream would agree that this is going to be kind of tough for the violin to play both parts. So I, I think it was a wise idea to write this for two violins. I'm, I'm guessing maybe that this was a, a bit of an afterthought, but it was a, a good idea for an afterthought. So in other words, it isn't a quartet, it's probably a quintet, and gentet is a, a good way to, to sum it up. And uh, I think also we can see, just looking at that first page, why uh, Jennifer has uh, used three lower instruments. Because if you have a look at that, um, the viola and the first cello, they're both playing this kind of chordal accompaniment and that carries on for a long time. And it's quite low down. If you were playing that on the piano, you would be probably using your left hand, but you do need a proper bass as well. And that's where the second cello comes in, uh, which is what happens. So um, scoring wise, I think that this uh, opening section is re really very good. And uh, all those string quartets, that uh, there's thousands of them have been written in history. Quite a lot of string quintets have been written as well. So uh, this is an interesting uh, form for to uh, explore. Now, let us, if we may, go uh, forward to page, let's say three, Richard, three and four, if we could. Because here we go, and uh, as you will gather uh, through this afternoon, something I very much like is contrast in the piece, and that's what we have here. Um, those uh, five-part textures stop. And um, what we have are these three parts, and they're played by violin one, viola, and cello. The, the, the first cello becomes the bass. Could we go to page four, Richard, the next one here? Thank you. Now, this is interesting, and um, again, it's the sort of thing would be really helpful if we had live performers, because we could ask them, how easy or difficult is this? I think it's always quite tricky, this business of string crossing, but this definitely looks like a lot of Baroque uh, string writing. But what's so interesting to me is that uh, Jennifer has two violins, but she decided that the duo would be with a viola. And uh, in a way, this is a, a line that could be played uh, mostly on the uh, violin, the second violin, but she's put it onto the uh, viola. Could be tricky for the viola, but it's one of those things that I, I think it's hard to say that's, that's wrong or it would have been better to write for two violins. And I can certainly see some notes that are just a little bit too low for the violin, but can be played on the viola. So that's another interesting piece of scoring. And of course, um, this is the B section of a composition which will return to the A section. Once again, uh, Richard, can, I, can we go backwards now to page one? Thank you very much. Uh, this is just one, technical uh, thing, which I see in a lot of string writing. Um, and it's the use of phrase marks. Let's look at the violins in bar seven, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten. For the string players, when they see a phrase like that, that means play it all underneath one bow. And I think that some of these phrase lengths are just a bit too long. Uh, and the other strange thing is that they are not the same as the opening phrase that the violin plays. I think that players appreciate consistency. So although everything that's been written is very playable for the violin at, at this point, um, 
I think you would get a lot of questions from your string players. They would say, well, the first time we played it, we played in the groups of two, and now you want us to play it two whole bars under one uh, phrase mark. Just remember that, that uh, when you see a phrase mark like that in singing, it means this is the phrase. But for the violinists, it, it's a direction as to changing their bow. And you've got a few other things of that kind, which, um, you know, they, they might be a little tricky, but they're interesting. What, what the viola is doing in bar nine there with all these accents under a phrase mark, it is possible. And uh, I, one of the very good things about this composition, you've been very clear about the things you do want, your markings, both the articulation markings and the dynamics. And that again is, is a, a great thing. In the middle section, however, you don't write any dynamics. You might have just run out of time or you just want them all to be at the same dynamic. So, uh, but I think uh, the level of dynamics you've put on this first page is, is ideal. It gives lots of information for the performers, but not too much. But they will ask you, if you don't put those dynamics in, they're bound to say, am I playing this quietly or loudly? And I think that's what they'll ask you in the middle section. Well, I'm very pleased to see a work in the, amongst the finalists for string ensemble, because so much of the great uh, classic music has been written for these small string ensembles. And I would strongly say to anyone who's interested in writing, try and find out about string writing if you are not a string player yourself, because it really is something worth, I would say, having a few lessons, even from one of your friends who plays the violin, ask them to give you one lesson in how the violin works, because it really is, it's rather mysterious unless you uh, really know the details of it. So I'm pleased to see someone who has really tackled this rather important uh, corner of uh, composition. Great, well, thank you, Judith. We'll move on to the next one now, which is The Dance of the Snags. And <clears throat> this one is by Tabena Onezu. And um, I shall now just get the audio going so we can have a listen. very much. Um, firstly, I like the title, The Dance of the Snags. I don't know if these were snags that you found while you were composing, but it's a, a very nice title. Now, I think I'm right in saying that unusually here, we've actually got 
a live performance. Is that right, Richard, rather than uh, computer generated? And I just want to take my hat off to that because uh, I think as you were listening, you'll notice there are so many things that we hear when instruments are played live that excellent though the computer um, versions that we can do these days, there's something really incredibly um, mm, vivid about hearing the live instruments. I, I noticed that I could hear um, the keys of the instruments coming down. You could often hear someone's tongue on the reed and uh, you know the particular tone color of the different instruments. So that gave me a great deal of pleasure. But I was also very pleased uh, for another reason, which is that it suggests to me that the composer has been working with these live musicians and therefore uh, she will absolutely know what was difficult and what was a good idea. She'll have had feedback from the performers. And I think that's a wonderful step to take whenever you can uh, try and get the actual live instruments together or write for whoever you know, because of, you know, I'm trying to give you a few pointers today, but the most education and pointers you will ever get are from the actual performers, and they will soon tell you if you've written something that's uh, unplayable or doesn't really work. And likewise, they'll thank you if, if you write them a beautiful solo. So um, already very happy with uh, that in this piece. Now, um, it's rather charming, I'm sure everybody noticed that we start this piece with each of the instruments introducing themselves, playing solo, and um, apart from the uh, bassoon, who we're soon going to learn quite a lot about, and uh, done so in these really very beautiful melodies, very well conceived for each instrument. And it's worth saying, in a woodwind quintet, these four instruments, okay, they're all woodwinds, but they are so different in character and sound and uh, a good composition will capitalize on that uh, feature of compared say with a string quartet where the four instruments okay have quite a lot of similarity in their actual sound quality so that's contrast that huge amount of instrument contrast is something that we get from this ensemble so what happens after uh, our introduction, perhaps we could have page two, Richard, to see this. And um, something that will become very familiar with through this composition is the bassoon part. Just have a look at that. It is uh, a kind of moto perpetuo. Um, it's uh, playing all the time these uh, pizzicati, sorry, uh, staccato uh, uh, quavers all the way through. And uh, my one thought about this, I just wonder, uh, uh, to ben, what, what your bassoon player said to you, that looks like quite a, a challenge for breathing, something you really have to think about writing for wind instruments. But that's how this piece works. It's got this constant bass line, and above it, the three instruments, the upper instruments, weave this melodic material really very beautifully. So we have a trio plus accompaniment from the, the bassoon. Um, I wonder if we could just have a look, uh, Richard, at page three and four. Would that be all right? Thank you so much. So really, that's what happens in this piece nearly to the uh, end, this big section up to the bottom of this page. But from bar 33, we have about five bars. Can we see page four now? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and I particularly like that first bar of page four. Uh, and I think if, if you were ever to revise or edit this work to Ben, I would enlarge this five bar section uh, going up to a uh, bar, hmm, rather small letters for me to see, uh, bar 36, because in a way as uh, in the string piece we just heard, that middle section, it, it might be nice, it is nice, in fact, that you've stopped the uh, constant bassoon just for a few bars. And it's incredibly exciting what you've written at the top for the flute. That's uh, a, a very interesting new development with that contrast. Now, um, perhaps, sorry, could we just go perhaps back to three, page three, Richard? Thank you very much. The other thing that makes this piece develop in a, a, a really interesting way is we start off, I think, hearing something that's fairly expectable in its tonality of D minor, 
But as the piece progresses, but very gradually, rather clever actually, a few different notes from what we're expecting are thrown in. And you can see in that flute part, uh, the second bar on this page. Um, on the previous page, we would have just expected A naturals, but look there, she's sort of slipped in that A flat there, and uh, that allows in the next bar uh, a G sharp, kind of the same note. We've, we've managed to enlarge that tune. And uh, same thing on the next stave, uh, the flute part, end of bar 27. We might have been expecting to hear a, a D natural, but we've got a D flat. And that is happening really through the piece. It's enlarging its uh, tonal sounds. And there's quite a prominent, uh, I won't say wrong note, but a note we're not expecting in, in the uh, penultimate bar. We might have thought a, a D natural and it's a, a D flat. So that makes for a very interesting uh, development. It, it's constantly catching us out and surprising us. Quite, quite exciting in that way. Um, there isn't so much wind chamber music written in the history of classical music. I mean, there's quite a lot, but uh, it can't compare with the string quartet repertory. So I think you're really onto something to write for a small group of woodwinds. There are some great uh, examples, nevertheless, uh, particular favorites of mine are a piece called Maladi by Janacek. That, that's a piece to check out for four, six woodwinds. And uh, the uh, recent composer, Georg Ligeti, he's written two famous wind quintets. And since you've written for winds yourself, you might be interested to check out those two works by Ligeti. But thanks very much for uh, giving us this yet again, a contrast to what we've heard so far. Thank you, Judith. Uh, so we'll now move on to the second in the uh, 15 to 16 category, which is called Leaving, and it's by Charles Henderson from St Ignatius School. So uh, I'll just get that uh, audio going. Well, thank you very much, Charles. And uh, in a way, you've uh, added to the different forms that we're looking at today. And most impressively, you've written for full orchestra. And in a way, that is the technical peak of the things that we try to do as composers, to write for all those instruments at once. And uh, certainly always has the most uh, technical questions in, involved. I think, in fact, you've written very well for this ensemble. Um, I will just say it's it's just there are always questions to be asked with orchestral scores. So I'll, I'll unfortunately you're not there for me to, to be able to talk to, but um, my questions would be just on this first page. And this is typical if you took a score 
to any conductor, they'd say, well, what does this mean? What, what are you doing there? What's that about? Uh, so my ones are that uh, just below your trombone, you've written baritone, and it's not totally clear to me what that is. You probably might mean baritone saxophone, that will be fine, but you've also put BC in brackets, which I imagine is bass clarinet, um, which you would normally write for in the treble clef, uh, a ninth below. So something like that perhaps needs a little bit more explanation. Um, below that, just a couple of lines, we just have the word percussion. And I looked through your score, but I couldn't quite see which percussion it was. So important to mark that up in the score so that, so that we know. And just so that you know, my final question, and I'm just being Mrs. Hypercritical Conductor, if you brought this along to an orchestra, the last uh, bar of this page, if we look to the viola, I wasn't quite sure what you meant by these three-part viola uh, chords with a kind of um, arpeggiation mark on them, uh, sort of thing you, you often see on piano or harp writing, but not so much on viola. So uh, th those are just a very small number of things that, that puzzled me in this piece, and I'm sure they can be very quickly sorted out. But uh, otherwise, uh, you've uh, worked very well with the orchestra. And I didn't see anything in the piece that wasn't playable. I didn't think anybody was having to play in the wrong register. And indeed, you've written some very beautiful solos, particularly for the wind instruments. Um, you've also put in very good dynamics. That's incredibly important for an orchestral uh, situation. Everybody in the orchestra is sitting there. They've got to know from your parts, from your orchestral parts, how loud or soft they're meant to be playing. It's, it's hopeless. Not everyone can't ask the questions at once. So that orchestral scores above all have to be very well notated with these basic in information. And uh, I think also the articulation marks on the whole uh, are also well, well put in. I, once again, I just have to say my thing about violin phrase marks, uh, string phrase marks, um, just on this first page, uh, particularly I'm looking at the double bass, the first three bars that they played are all under one bow. And I think just thinking about the bass and how short that bow is and how far it's got to travel, I personally would put no more than one bar to a bow on that. Again, that's the sort of thing that might be sorted out in a rehearsal with the string section, but ideal if you can write in the perfect bowing so that they don't have to lose valuable time in the rehearsal. So um, just so very quickly looking through this really quite clear and skillful st structure, we have a little bit of an introduction, which we've just seen on page one. If we could go to um, page two, if that's all right, Richard, and uh, at the top, if we can see it, great. And um, very important to this piece is this lovely oboe melody, which uh, returns at the end of the composition. So this is another kind of uh, arch shape, uh, which is then taken up. Uh, can we see just, uh, it's a bit hard to, this is uh, page three. Could we have a look at that at the top of the page if possible? Great. And you can see that the flute has now joined in in this beautiful melody and below, this very successful counter melody going upwards in the, in the bassoon. So very good writing there. And um, then if we could go to page four, Richard, thank you so much. Now we have a new melody. It's, it's kind of in the same spirit as the previous melody, but as you can see, it's four beats in the bar instead of three. Once again, played by these upper woodwind instruments joined by the violins and um, it still has this rising melody with the bassoon. So you've sort of developed your opening oboe tune into something that's a bit broader and still very, very beautiful. And uh, the most, I suppose, exciting pages that we can look at, perhaps we could see page five, if that's okay. Richard, thank you. And now uh, this has become really quite energized. Uh, everyone is playing fortissimo. Uh, one final question I had really, uh, if I was the conductor, would be this piano part. You can see that the piano in the middle is playing in a very, very busy um, figuration. I would worry a little bit about whether that can actually be played when all the other instruments are playing at the loudest. And this is really 
in orchestral writing, if you're the composer, this is, I think, your number one problem, actually, all the time is, can I hear this instrument? Can I hear that instrument, particularly in these big tutti passages? So it's something I think that you just build up experience of, but ideally you build up experience of live orchestras because of course a computer realization, you can always check what's going on. But uh, I think on the whole, this is well balanced. Um, just finally to say a little bit about the, the um, tonal plan of this uh, composition, which is uh, uh, even the bit you all heard, uh, again, very natural, very, pleasantly um, developed. It stays pretty close to the F minor key that it's written in, but it quite skillfully moves into close by keys like uh, D flat and A flat, which are very related to F minor. And it takes us at one point to C minor, a, a sort of dominant of, of F, and uh, that allows us for a moment to go into the relative major of C minor. E flat major. So even something that doesn't sound as if it's um, roaring around the corner and changing its keys, it actually travels quite a long way in a, a smooth way. So I, I would just say this is a skilled um, piece of composition. The tunes are very beautiful and um, a, a very good um, a, a first, uh, first work on the complicated job of writing orchestral music. So well done. Thank you, Judith. So we're now going to move on to the first of the 17 to 18 year old category, and that is um, Jig by, uh, who have we got here? Adam Howe. So let's have a look at that one. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a shame we can't listen to the whole of this piece because it really is a very dazzling composition. And the first thing I want to congratulate Adam on is um, writing a, a piece, well, three minutes long, which is all fast. It is very difficult to write fast music and keep people's interest going. And this is really a fantastic uh, uh, example of that. So I think even the small amount that you've heard, you can see that this has a remarkable contrapuntal technique, the, the ability to put different lines together, really a fugal style and make them all sound in proper harmony together while they're all going in totally different directions. It's not exactly a strict fugue because after the first two lines of, of imitation have entered, you'll see that the bass line at the top of this first page we're looking at, that isn't the fugal su subject, but it's um, a, a kind of continuo bass line. It's again, still fits absolutely beautifully. And uh, it's almost like we're in a kind of um, 
roller coaster of, of uh, different things happening. You can see at the bottom of page one, uh, all this three part texture stops and we have this downward phrase. If we could go, uh, Richard, to page two. So you can see halfway down here, we, we end the first kind of episode and then that downward phrase, which we thought was just a kind of breather for the right hand, that turns into a new uh, contrapuntal subject. You can see he's doing two-part imitation here as well. And uh, this kind of thing happens all the way through the piece. Now, the other thing that is really quite satisfying is how many different keys this piece manages to travel through without sounding as if it's, again, turned the corner too suddenly or uh, giving us a bit of a shock because there's been such a surprising change of key. And uh, we can sort of see that actually at the top of this page, we're looking at page two. Uh, if you can remember at the end of page one, we started off in D major, but somehow we uh, found ourselves in a, a keys with C sharp, uh, a E sharp and G sharp sort of adjacent to D. So uh, that allows Adam by uh, page two, if you can see just the end of the first bar, the C sharp, E sharp and G sharp, they turn into D flat, F natural and uh, A flat. And uh, that is turns out to be the dominant of his next key, which is uh, G flat. Uh, so that's from bar three. And again, all through the piece, it's, it's a bit like he's sort of turning on a sixpence or something like that. Just a, a very, very simple way of uh, not exactly modulating, but uh, transitioning into a new key. So that's one of the great pleasures of this piece. We don't know where it's going, but it's always taking us somewhere. Now, the next thing to say is that, uh, that I think there's a very, I would almost call it witty use of harmony in this piece. You, the extract that you heard, I think quite honestly, if you just heard that one day and you didn't know what it was, you might think it was um, a Bach jig that you didn't know. This is something that Bach was always doing. Um, the jig was a dance form, but almost for fun, he would write very fugy, counterpointy versions of it, still with a kind of dancing energy as this piece has. Um, so that uh, is definitely Bach-like, but pretty soon we start having little touches of things that are not like Bach. And the first place that really struck me like that is bar 51 and bar 53. Uh, we have a kind of harmonic shift, which is definitely not out of the Baroque, that's much more uh, late 19th century or 20th century. And uh, this really increases very quickly. Um, let me see, uh, let's find us uh, some good examples of this, Richard. Um, uh, by the time we get to say page four, if we may have a look at that. Thank you so much at the top there. Just look at that uh, top stave, uh, what the bass line is doing. That, that's become actually much more like one of those Rachmaninoff, Mussorgsky composers, but we got there somehow. And then just immediately after that, this is the other really interesting thing about this piece, the number of different registers on the keyboard it uses. It started off with the hands right in the middle, just as you would playing a Bach, anything, a Bach prelude and fugue or something. And then if you can remember, we were looking at those very bass, bass type uh, uh, features, which was the next. And now look what's happened. Um, the uh, right hand is going right out into outer space. It's got an octava mark on it. So that hand is right up at the top of the keyboard. And then look on the second stave, where is the left hand? Right at the other end, it too is going to have an octava mark. So those hands are really quite a few feet apart. That's a very unusual uh, way of writing for the piano, but it's rather wonderful because the piano is a brilliant instrument. And unfortunately, so often, we don't hear much more than the middle two or three octaves. So uh, in this piece, uh, that's another thing that we travel through are the different uh, registers of the piano. Well, I think I could go on and on telling you all the fun things that I've noticed in this piece, but uh, it's a, an exercise, of course. I mean, uh, looking back to a 
a previous style. It, it, on the whole, people don't write fugal gigs these days, but um, this has been a really incredible feat of uh, contrapuntal writing. So can only say well done to you. Thank you, Judith. So we're now on to the, the last of the 17 to 18 year olds. And this is a piece called uh, Rainfall by uh, Lace Corrigan. So um, I'll just get this one ready and we'll have a listen. Thank you very much. Well, uh, this uh, composition for flute and piano is, is uh, so sensitively written for flute. I'm, I wonder if, in fact, the composer maybe is a flute player because it certainly fits the instrument very well. The, the one thing it doesn't use is the bottom register of the flute. It uh, doesn't need to, but uh, that's the one thing that has been left out of, of the use of the flute and otherwise uh, it gives a, a very very beautiful picture of what, what the flute can do and uh, again you can just see some of these pages it's been the articulation and dynamic markings are, are completely accurate here I didn't see anything that didn't make sense and in fact I think it's very well marked up so anyone who played this composition I think there will be very few questions about what should the performer do at any place and I think, again, from the extract you've just heard, it's interesting feature, the way it works. It's not just a solo for flute, but very, very often it's a duet between the piano right hand and the flute. And uh, so often the uh, flute or maybe the piano will introduce a tune and then the other instrument will play a kind of counterpoint against it. We can see that. Can we see page two or the next spread of pages of that. Thank you very much. So remember that that the um, piano started off going da 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 dum at the end of page one and here's the flute kind of playing a, a duet against that hand and that carries on right through this page and indeed right through the composition pretty much. Um, there's a sort of contrasting section in the middle. I wonder if we could see Richard. Ooh, is it possible to see Mm, that maybe page four, could we see the top of that? Just a thought I had about, I think the most beautiful part is for just in my own personal taste is this section where the piano left hand starts to play this beautiful sequence of, of chords and as usual, the upper hand and the uh, flute are duetting away. It made me think that this piece could even be rescored for fl flute and strings thinking particularly about the famous Bach second suite for, for flute and strings. But this, I think, would sound gorgeous with a string orchestra playing these left-hand piano chords. But it's fine for piano as well, works perfectly well and uh, very expressively. Um, th this is um, another composition where it stays fairly closely in its uh, home key, but with some quite clever movements out of it. We're in F minor, but uh, somehow via various chords, we are able to swivel into, for instance, um, F major in, in the page that we're looking at. And uh, 
by this page that, in fact, we're looking at in a sort of B flat minor, I could see that uh, fairly soon we get back towards the home key again. Uh, it's all done very subtly and it has a, a very beautiful, quiet character. I was tempted at first because I've been saying this to more or less everybody, could the piece have a bit more contrast? Uh, and of course it does stay very consistently within its style. But it has so many of these little changes and what we're looking at just now, this page is a very good example of that. This is actually quite removed from what happened at the beginning of the piece. So it's a, a piece that actually covers quite a lot of distance um, while gradually making one change after another. Um, in a way, it would be very interesting to hear a piece for the same instruments of completely different character. There's a very settled gentleness about this tune. It's so beautifully melodic. It might be interesting as your next composition, if you're still interested in writing for flute, to write something that has a lot more perhaps aggression or noise because the flute equally well can do that. And obviously this is a composer who understands the instrument and we don't have really enough solo flute music in the repertory still. And uh, anyone who could compose new flute music, I think would be onto a good thing. So I'm, I'm going to leave it there, uh, a, a very good composition for that instrument. Great, well, thank you very much, Judith. So that sort of concludes all of the pieces that we've been through. Um, just before I ask Judith to announce the winners, I just wanted to uh, just mention uh, three compositions. So these were compositions which we at Music First felt um, should have a kind of a special mention for uh, ones that we really liked. Um, although they didn't quite make the final, uh, we thought they were um, excellent pieces. So the first one is, um, by Jessica Priest, and this is in the 17 to 18 year old ca category, and it was for a piece called uh, The Broken Toy. And that was that was my favorite, actually, a really, really good piece. Um, in the 15 to 16 year olds, a piece by uh, Maddie, and that was Timeless. And then in the 11 to 14 year olds, a piece called Waves, and that was by Frederick Johnson. So thank you to all um, all of them, really, really good pieces. And um, when we were looking through the vast array of uh, compositions that came in, those three were um, particularly stood out um, alongside the finalists. So um, can I now ask Judith to announce the winners of each of the categories? Well, I really want to say, first of all, that uh, I've grown to love all the compositions that I've looked at very much. So it's a rather painful for me to be told to choose between uh, one out of two. Uh, and I'll try and explain very briefly in each case why I've reluctantly uh, chosen my winners. Um, in the first category, we're talking about 11 to 14 year olds. Um, in the end, with a lot of soul searching, I've given the first prize to Boromir Ivanov for a Prelude in E flat minor. Um, very difficult for me to, to say that because I also enjoyed the string piece by uh, Jennifer Rees, but um, I suppose I have to just give it to uh, Boromir because of its incredible uh, skill uh, in piano writing. And I think it's a piece that could immediately be played in a concert and, and probably will be, I, I hope so. So congratulations to you. Right, <laughs> my next category, I had even more of a problem between the dance of the snags, as you remember, for the four woodwind instruments and leaving uh, by Charles, uh, because uh, these again are completely different compositions, completely different musical situations. And my choice was between the orchestral work very well, smoothly, technically well written, and this rather brave uh, wind quartet, um, which uh, really excited my imagination, uh, particularly because the composer had worked live with the performers. Well, I guess I'm feeling brave this afternoon and I'm going to award the prize to The Dance of the Snags by to Tobena Onyeso. Uh, I wish I could award a joint first prize, but I've been asked to award a prize, that is it, the wind, quint, wind quartet. 
Right, and now the final category, uh, again, two very different pieces, that beautiful flute and piano piece, once again, something I think that could go straight into a concert, and this uh, rather crazy jig, which uh, so impressed me with its technical qualities. Well, sometimes I just have to admire technique and craziness, so I'm going to award the prize to Adam Howell and his jig. There it is. Great, thank you very much, Judith. Now we've just had um, one question um, come in from Betty Power. Um, to help students create more contrast in their compositions. Yes, I, I want to stress first of all that um, some compositions work perfectly well without contrasts. And that this afternoon where I've mentioned it, I just wanted to add perhaps to the, the pieces that they could go even further. In my own, I can only speak about how I write music myself. And I think the answer there is that before I even start writing the piece, I do a lot of sketching. And when I say sketching, I often mean just little doodles or scribbles on the page of possible ideas that I might have. And then I start off writing the piece as everybody has done today, and I probably get quite a long way. But I'm usually so glad that I have that my page of scribbles because I might get to a point where I think something new has to happen in this composition. And uh, some of the things that I maybe didn't think of at first turn out to be very useful. So I suppose the kind of things that you might scribble down Firstly, just think, what instruments are you writing for? What are, have a brainstorm. What are all the things that you would like to hear it do? You couldn't possibly get, get a violin to play 12 different kinds of music in one piece, but you can certainly think of 12 different things the violin can do. So even a, a few notations of that kind, uh, and then maybe select, select more than one or two things to do. I stress that uh, it can be as much of a problem if a piece has too much contrast as if it has none. But I would just also suggest look at, and particularly the classical pieces that you most enjoy. Very often they do have separate sections which do quite different things. I think the classic composers like Mozart, Beethoven and Haydn, they are always working in this way and that's how they manage to generate quite uh, substantial and long pieces with, by incorporating lots of contrasting material. I wish I could give more specific uh, information than that, but uh, a bit of sketching, a bit of free imagining, sketching, scribbling, doodling is my way to start. Okay, Judith, um, just a couple of other just quick questions here. Um, this is, I think, has come from a student who's written, I love composing in the style of my favourite composers, such as Bart, Beethoven, Bach, Schubert, um, etc. Should I be trying to move away from that, seeing as we're no longer living in Beethoven's time, and move towards the 20th, 21st century, which um, compos uh, composition styles I personally am not so fond of? Well, I think that's absolutely fair enough. I think it's it's so important to um, composing is really creating the music that you want to hear. And if you feel that even bearing in mind the huge repertoires that all those three composers, some of my absolute favorites too, by the way, if you feel you can add something to that style, if there's something that doesn't exist that you feel you can compose in those styles, that is great, and it's also a great education. Um, if I may just mention the winner in the most senior category, that Gigue, uh, he had learned a lot from Bach, but he'd somehow managed to do his own version of it, which ended up being not like Bach at all. So it would be my hope that you would pick a technique out of some of your favorite composers, but somehow through your explorations, end up with something that is uh, original to yourself. But I suppose, I guess, when we're studying and when we're educating ourselves, it's good to be as wide as you can. So occasionally, maybe to branch out, is there a composer a little bit close to those favourite composers, but a little later? I'm thinking of somebody like 
Ravel, who often himself wrote in the style of Bach, have a look at a composer like him and see if you could in some way emulate him. But I, I go back to my thought that really composing should be something that you want to do, that you like the results. It's not going to turn out very well if you write in a style you hate. So uh, I think Bach, Beethoven and Schubert are, are very good models for the moment. Okay, so just one final question. Um, do you have any tips for building up a well-rounded portfolio of works? Well, uh, this is a, in a way a question possibly directed towards um, exam submissions. And I, I'm very rusty now about the various syllabuses and, and what they would like to see. Um, so I'm going to answer the question perhaps a bit more purely about uh, what any composer should have as a portfolio. And I almost think we should look at what we've seen today. Uh, I think we've seen a, a piece for strings, a piece for woodwinds. We saw an orchestral piece. We saw a couple of keyboard uh, pieces which were just as completely different as they could be. Uh, uh, I think we saw also a flute and piano sonata. So I would definitely say a portfolio that shows you can write for really most of the instruments. And let's not leave out vocal music as well, because that has all sorts of versions. We didn't see any today, but uh, there are solo songs, there are oratorios and masses, and there are ensemble songs like madrigals and uh, part songs and so on. So ideally, I would want to see some vocal music, some instrumental music, and I'd also like to see some contrast between using large groups and of singers or instruments and down to solo work. All these are, are different challenges, but uh, I don't want to give you uh, all the wrong uh, information about exams, which you may be taking uh, answered in its most uh, simple form that that is my answer. And if you had one word of advice for passionate young musicians, what would it be? I think it's got to be listen to music and play it if you can. That, that's, how you will, that's how you will learn the, the, the actual live engagement with, with actual sounds. That, that's the fun part, I think. Do as much of that as you can. Right, okay, well, um, Thank you all very much for coming and thank you very much to Judith. Um, I think, Jim, you, you might want to uh, say something right at the end. Yes, I, again, thank you to all the teachers and to all the students for doing the hard work, which is yeah. getting students inspired to compose and you students putting this music down on paper. I will say that every entry that we received, um, everyone on the staff was completely impressed with the level. It was a very difficult decision to narrow it down to a few finalists uh, for Judith to listen to and comment on. Um, you should all be, no matter whether your piece was selected or not, you should be very proud of what you've done. Um, and please, we, we uh, urge you, and I'm sure Judith would join me in this, keep composing, um, keep playing, keep listening, keep making music, because whether or not it becomes your career, whether or not you become a professional composer like Judith, it should always be a part of your life. Um, and it's one of those beautiful things that can be. So again, thank you uh, to the teachers and students. And most importantly, thank you, Judith, uh, for your incredibly inspiring and uh, really well thought out advice and critiques to the students today. I, I think every teacher and student knows that you spent a lot of time on these compositions and we thank you for your expertise and, and joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right, with you. that, everyone, yeah. go ahead, Richard. Um, I was just gonna say that um, I'm just gonna leave everyone by playing my favorite piece, which was the jig. So if you want to stick around to hear that, then, yeah. Um, yeah. then do.